Uh, a lot of people have heard this and probably thought that these guys from the band The Bird actually wrote the lyrics, but they didn't. They took them from the scriptures. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I want to take tonight, I want to take this theme in a different direction and then tie it all together. Am I not loud enough? Can you guys hear me? All right. All right, so Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's look at, there we go. Let's look at uh, verse 1. It says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And let me just add an additional verse. There's a time to preach and a time to shut up. <laughs> so I'm going to try to go 15 minutes and no more. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. So what do these verses tell us exactly? Well, they're a beautiful a poem about the orderliness of time. Uh, more than that, they're about the God who ordains and orders time. God is not listed in these, these verses, but Solomon, or the writer of Ecclesiastes, most assuredly has God in mind as he writes them, especially as you read further into the text beyond these verses. And from the very start of this passage, we get a hint that these words, these verses are not about us. It comes to us in verse 1 with the word season. Uh, the noun season in Hebrew means appointed time or predetermined season. And so these verses... They're about God's activity and not man's. That God is sovereign over every aspect of human beings' lives. Birth and death, sickness and health, poverty and abundance, and so, so on. And Solomon is saying here that no matter how you slice life, the sovereignty of God lies behind everything that happens. Now, admittedly, that doesn't make life always that easy because we often don't understand God and the ways of God. Uh, in, in some way, it'd be much more, it's, it, it's much easier to understand the devil than God. I mean, if, if the devil had a resume, uh, it would have like one line on it and two words. Do evil. Right? It's pretty easy to understand that. But how can God be good and loving and all-powerful and yet evil persists and touches our lives in so many ways? Why doesn't he act to stop and change things in our world? Uh, things that from every possible angle of logic and compassion seem reasonable. These are tough questions. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes in chapters 1 and 2, Solomon has show, shows us what life is, is like if we try to live it without him. But then we get to chapter 3 here and we find out we're going to have just as much of a problem with God in our lives than without him. Because it's often difficult to interpret God's actions in the short term. And so Solomon wants us to know that however we try to resolve the fact that evil exists and that God is good, that we can't do it by saying God isn't in control. And listen, this is an important thing to remember. God is not always pleased with what happens in this world, but he, he's never perplexed. He's never surprised by it. His will, his plans are never thwarted, never delayed, never defeated. Now, in addition to showing us God's sovereignty, these verses are meant, I think, to show us that life is often unpredictable and it's outside of our own control. As the poet Robert Burns once said, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Um, something as typical as a family vacation really, I think, illustrates this well. So think about you and your family. You and your spouse, you look ahead on your calendars. You coordinate your schedules, your vacation time to take the family to Wally World. 
And so uh, you, you reserve a place to stay. You, you save up your money. You plan the events that you and the kids are going to do. And you count down the days on the calendar until vacation comes. But it doesn't stop there either, does it? Because you check with your smartphone to see how long it will take you to get from your home to your vacation destination. Or if you're old school, you use a map. And maybe you build a little bit of extra time into it for bathroom breaks and lunch. And everything is planned. Everything is set. The trip, it should only take eight, eight hours. But it ends up taking 11. How does that happen? It's called life. You got a flat tire. You ran into heavy traffic and road work. Even though there's never anybody working on the roads. You ever notice that? <laughs> Severe weather, you know brings the traffic to a standstill, or you get rerouted off the interstate to some weird, you know, country road out in the middle of nowhere. That's a picture of life in general. Life often has twists and turns and, and detours and, and breakdowns. It's not predictable, and, and we're not in control. I mean, think about it this way. Did, raise your hand. Did anybody here plan their own birth? <laughs> kind of weird if you did. How many people know the moment of their own death. Live long enough, and someone you love will die. But can you predict how long you're going to mourn their passing? I mean, can you get your calendar out and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna weep over the death of my, my mother for three weeks, and then I'm just gonna go play golf and go on about my life. Do you know if your investments will do well in this coming year? I mean, it could be that your wealth is going to increase dramatically over the course of 2019. Maybe you'll be living in a better house, a better job, maybe a different state. Perhaps you'll, you'll meet your true love and you'll be married. And if you're already married, that is your true love. <laughs> we cannot know what life will bring. Life, in all of its good, in all of its bad, happens upon us ready ready or not. And every time something happens to us to show us that we're not in control of life, we get frustrated as though it's some kind of anomaly. But the truth is, that is how life really is. No one can bribe God. No one can pressure Him to do what we want Him to do. We have absolutely no leverage over the seasons of life. I wonder if any of this makes you angry or anxious or frustrated. I think Solomon anticipated this because it leads him to ask in verse 9, what do workers gain from their toil? In other words, their work. I have seen, he says, the burden God has laid on the, the human race. I think Solomon here is anticipating the reader's thoughts. He's, he's anticipating that we would, we would read this and we would go, well, then what's the point? I mean, if we have no control, if we have no advantage over the seasons of, of life, is God, if God's in charge, and I'm not, then what difference does any of this make? And that could be your conclusion when you look at life. But Solomon, I think, had a higher view than that, because down in verse 11, he says something that's pretty powerful. He says, he, meaning God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Friends, that's a statement of faith. Solomon turns away from talking about man's toil and the questions about what kind of leverage or gain that we have in this life. He turns his attention instead toward God. And his conclusion is, even though we don't have advantage, God does. God makes everything, he says, beautiful in its time. So what does that, what does that mean? Well, you think back to those first eight verses again and, and the list of seven pairs there of opposing things. Things like birth and death and kill and hill and... Tear down, build, mourn, dance, war and peace. That's what he means. God has a plan for everything that touches our lives. In the Old Testament, a young man had a dream. God showed him that one day he would become a great ruler. So he excited about the dream. He sits down at breakfast with his dad and his brothers over a bowl of fruit loops and tells them. But they thought he was a bit loopy. Soon after, his life took a series of turns he never ex expected. His, his jealous brother sold him into slavery and then told his parents that he had died. Then later, he was falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit, thrown in jail, and forgotten. And yet, through all of his disappointments, through all of the injustices he experienced in life, he never stopped trusting God. 
Eventually it came to pass that God fulfilled his promise to Joseph, and he became a great ruler in Egypt. And his leadership was absolutely pivotal. It was critical in saving the nation and many people in the world at that time who were going through a great famine. One day, Joseph is sitting out and he's looking across the kingdom and he can see men and women and little children laughing and dancing and eating and drinking in the midst of a famine. And it's in that moment that he begins to look at his life and he begins to realize that God has beautifully been orchestrating the events of his life to bring him to such a position. Eventually he reconciles with those wicked brothers of his and he says to them this, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Friends, no matter how senseless, painful, or chaotic our lives be, may be, we have a promise that God is working to make things beautiful in his appointed time. Our efforts, our toil is vapor, but God's never is. We may, we, we may never see or be able to discern it. We may never be able to comprehend it. There may be answers that we never receive on this side of eternity, but the promise of Scripture is that God works everything according to His will and His providence and for our good. But none of this is, this is, none of it is easy for us. Life often feels like we're stuck on I-95 South. You ever been stuck on I-95 South? <laughs> You know, you're sitting there 20 minutes have passed and the cars still aren't moving and you're, you're wanting to know why and you're wondering, is there a wreck up ahead? Are they doing road work? Is there a, a police checkpoint? And hopefully you're not drinking liquor or anything like that. You know, did a government train derail and the zombie apocalypse happen? I mean, we just want to know what's going on. So eventually you get so frustrated, you get out of your car and what do you do? You, 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 you look and you stand on your tiptoes and as far as you can see, there's nothing but a, 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 just cars, unending cars. And then you turn around and look behind you and the same thing and to your left and to your right. What do you see? You see a sea of cars. And you realize you are stuck. And it is frustrating. Hmm. Solomon says we are stuck between time and eternity. And God has made it that way. Ecclesiastes goes on to say that God has built that frustration into us. He, he has placed within us a yearning for what transcends the moment, this present moment. And so we want to know the beginning and we want to know the end of things. But God has put it outside of our reach. So what do we do? Well, I don't have the time to, to get into it, but let me simply kind of summarize it. One thing the Bible tells us to do is trust God. Trust God with what we don't know. Trust God with what we can't see. Trust God with what we can't understand. And then the second thing the Bible tells us to do is make the most of the time that we have on this earth. You know, there's a verse in the New Testament that really captures this well. It's in Acts chapter 13, verse 36. It, talks about King David. It says, now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, listen to this, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. In other words, David, when it says he served God in his own generation, he was born at a particular period in history. That wasn't an accident. And he was born to be a part of, of God's plan. The verse ends with his body decayed, right? It's David's life is not really about David. It's really about God. It's really about his plan, his glory. But he was born at a particular point in history to serve God's purposes, to fulfill God's purpose for his life. Have you ever asked the question why you were born in America and not in, let's say, India? Why you were born in the 20th or the 21st century and not in the 13th? The answer is that God sovereignly chose you to be born at this time. And just as David served God in his own generation, God has uniquely wired you to serve your generation. So you have one life, one opportunity to make a unique, God-appointed, God-designed contribution for this generation. And my challenge to you and myself is don't miss it. Don't miss it. This past summer, I've had two things that have happened in my life, one very good and one very bad. I'll tell you about the good one first. My father-in-law um, had to have a kidney transplant. Found out he was born with one ki kidney. We didn't know that. 
didn't know it his whole life. He was born with one kidney, had stage four cancer in it. They had to remove it. He had, didn't have a backup. He was on dialysis for three years. Now, I'm very ignorant of this process, very naive. I thought kidney dialysis was kind of like plugging in your iPhone. You know, you, you got, they put a port in, they plug, you know, took your blood out, put it back in, you went home, life was normal, and you were fine. And I was so, so wrong. I watched my father-in-law, he's one of probably the best men I've ever known personally. I watched him go from vibrant and energetic to like an old man overnight. It just, it just literally sucked the life out of him. It was, honestly, it was, it, was, it was heartbreaking to watch him go through that. The good news is, and I don't have time to tell you all the details, but he got a kidney this summer. And as he was lying there in the bed and, and everything was working, he said, you know, he cried and he, we, we cried with him. He said, um, this has been hard. It's been harder than I ever imagined. And I wouldn't want to go back through it all. He said, but I would not want to trade what God has done through me in me and through me as a result of this, this period of my life. He said, I have built such relationships at the dialysis center, and I have been able to minister to people and share God's love with them in a way that I never would have had that opportunity to start or do before. Friends, can I just tell you, that's the way to use your sorrow and your trials redemptively. Charles Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. So what negative things have happened to you? How has God used it to grow you as a believer, to increase your dependence on Christ? You know, we've been asking tonight, who is my neighbor? I want you to think about God's sovereign design and shape of your life that's made you uniquely you. How are you using that to love and serve your neighbor? You know, the last part of this verse here, and I'll end with this, is David, it says, eventually died, which means... That fulfilling God's purpose in David's life was chronologically limited. It also means it's chronologically limited in your life and mine. There's a window of opportunity for us to make a difference. The second story is that my mom died this summer, very unexpectedly, 78 years old. Her, her death, I think, was preventable. And uh, I got the call about 4 a.m. I got up, and got dressed, put my stuff in the car, headed... Uh, headed out, and uh, as I finally made a few calls and did, got things arranged, I got in the car, and my cell phone went off. Now, my cell phone goes off every Sunday morning about anywhere from 5.45 to 6 a.m., and it's set that way. I get up very early on Sundays, and it reminded me of the fact, when my phone went off, it reminded me of the fact that there is God's time, and there's my time. There's the planning that we do with our lives, and there's then there's the appointed hours of our death that God has set when our lives and our potential is over. You know, in the Gospels, Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. So, brothers and sisters, let's not miss the chronological window of God's opportunity that he has placed in our lives. God clearly has a purpose for your life. Let's make the most of it. Let's love our neighbors. Let's share the gospel. Let's bring God's glory or bring glory to God by the way we live our lives.